So, all right, well, welcome everybody to our land conversations. I'm happy to be talking about, still talking about soil and vegetables and growing things. And I hope that uh, we can all learn something from each other. Teresa and Joe wanted me to talk about now what? Now that we've uh, grown our first crop of summer vegetables, uh, fall is around the corner, and then of course winter, and what should we be doing next? And so, well, first of all, there's lots of produce, produce right now because it is the peak of it all. So eat it, enjoy it as much as you can. And um, if you have too much, then share it. Don't be stingy with it. And besides sharing, uh, you could also just preserve it and uh, save it for the, for the winter and for the months that you're not gonna have this many tomatoes and peppers and eggplants growing. We'll talk about uh, story, uh, saving food or preserving food a little later, but uh, to address the question of what do you do with your beds once you're done with the summer uh, summer crop, then I'd say, first of all, save some seeds. Generally, if you've grown, whatever you've grown, at least keep one of three or four plants that you have, at least keep one of them to go to seed and then save those seeds so that you don't buy new seeds and you know where the, the source of your seeds, you've grown them. And I'm thinking that you've all grown yours organically, you have not put any synthetic fertilizer in your soil. So this is, you know, organic seeds that you're growing. Um, uh, sorry, saving. One of the simplest ways to save seed is to just cover the seed pod with a, with a paper bag and sort of tie it up and let the, the seed head dry in there. And after a while, just cut the stem off and then let it sit there and kind of shake it into that bag. And there are your seeds. But with some seeds like tomatoes and even peppers, you really can't do that. You need to cut them. With tomatoes, you need to let them actually ferment and dry them out. And then you save the seeds, a longer process. Uh, maybe that could be another subject, seed saving. But the first thing I would do is hold on to some, some plants for seeds. Let them, let them bolt and let them go to seed and then save the seed. Besides that, uh, a lot of plants, if you've been really, really fantastic about everything, then um, you know, you'd have no disease right now, which, uh, which would be terrific. But if there is disease on your tomato plants and your peppers and your eggplants and whatever else you've been growing, then don't worry too much about it. You're at the tail end of it. Um, the, the plant is still going to produce food, in other words, fruit. And so just let it keep doing that. S sort of clean it all up. There will be powdery mildew, there'll be spider mites, the usual blight, uh, the usual culprit, some, some serious sunburn because it has been extremely hot. Um, spray them with, you know, with neem oil or a mixture, of, a mixture of milk and water, two parts of milk to one part of water, mix it up and then spray the leaves really thoroughly, the front and the back of the leaves wherever you are seeing this disease. Um, and, um, or baking soda and water, that, uh, that, also, that also works. But um, you're not gonna take care of the disease by doing that. You just kind of prevent it from spreading further and further to other plants uh, nearby. And, uh, but the fruit is still edible and it's fine. And even if you ate the leaves that have powdery mildew on them or, or uh, Spider mites, you're not going to die of it. It's not poisonous. It's not going to kill you. Um, then, but you will remove all of it and throw it away in the trash or burn it. Do not put it back into a compost. Mix it with compost and don't leave it there on your plant either, it's particularly the whole squash family. Just keep cutting those mildewy leaves off. Wash them really thoroughly with like a power wash. And then you, if you're still getting it, cut all those leaves off, you'll get a fresh growth of leaves and, um, and keep it clean. And, and to wash these leaves, do them in the morning. Don't do it in the late afternoon. Don't do, definitely don't do it in the middle of the heat of the day, 
Also don't do it in the late evening because then it, the leaves won't have enough time to dry out. Do it very early in the morning uh, so that the leaves have time to dry out. And, um, and then once you're done with everything that you've managed to save and managed to eat and uh, hold on to it so that you can preserve some of it, then, pull, like I said, pull out everything that's diseased and throw it away and, or burn it. Um, and then in your bed, I generally, I'm not, a sci I'm not a pathologist, so I cannot really tell you what happens to soil as far as disease goes. There are fungal diseases and there are bacterial diseases and there are airborne diseases and there's all kinds of stuff happening out there. And each one of them have their own unique specific uh, remedy or treatment. Um, and soil, in general, some of the diseases are soil borne and some are just air borne. So I normally don't throw away all the soil. Whatever is there is there. I build up on that soil with adding more fresh compost um, and mulch uh, and, then, and then fresh clean, clean soil and again mulch. So that, um, and then just let it sit there through, uh, through the fall. Uh, though if you want to do winter planting, then you won't let it sit there. Then you start planting in it, not quite yet. And for yourselves to get ready for the winter planting, I would say start, uh, start seedlings, even though it's really hot right now and you think you know, that's the last thing that's going to survive because they're so tiny and small and delicate. But uh, you can start your seedlings right now. I mean, keep them in a, in a protected place, in a sheltered place that they, don't, they aren't getting nuked outside. Um, and keep them moist at all times, whether you're doing it in six packs or whether you're doing it in flats or in beds, keep it covered and keep it moist. As soon as they dry out or there is extreme, like too wet or too dry, that's when you begin to kill your, seedling, your seeds. And seeds are really the cheapest way to do uh, uh, vegetable planting, any kind of planting. Uh, so I would, I would highly recommend that you'd, you experiment with seeds before you start just buying seedlings. Uh, because buying seedlings is kind of like a shortcut. Somebody else has done all the work for you. Um, which is, of course, great, but, but try with seeds yourself. And so all of the, um, you know, the kale and the kohlrabi and the, and the broccoli, the cabbage, the cauliflower, that, that whole family, you can start putting seeds in and start the little seedlings now. So that uh, when it cools down and when the temperatures, the soil temperatures are down to 80 degrees and less, then you can start moving those seedlings into your beds. Um, also, you can, start, uh, you can start direct seeding uh, very delicate seeds like lettuce and whatever, carrots, and so that you have a constant supply of carrots and lettuce and um, spinach. Uh, all these are really tiny seeds and you can make little seedlings of them, but they're a real nuisance to, uh, to do. So you just sort of direct seed them in your beds. Uh, and then you can keep seeding every three weeks. You can add a new, you know, a new batch of uh, spinach and lettuce and carrot seedlings so that you have a constant supply of it through the winter months. Um, none of them like to be, uh, you know, they, these seeds are so small that when you spread them and you put them into your beds, a lot of them will grow together. So when they are, uh, when they have a few leaves, like four leaves at least, or a little, like an inch big, tall, or an inch and a half, separate them, gently take them out and separate them. And they should be um, a few inches apart, maybe two or three inches, maybe at the most four inches apart. Because remember the, the lettuce is looking this small right now, but it's gonna be a lettuce head and it's, it is gonna be four inches wide. So sort of space it, imagining how big it's ultimately gonna, gonna be. Give, it, give, them, give them room. Uh, the same with the carrots, you know, just imagine that the carrot is, you know, this tiny little skinny thing, but it's going to grow wider and wider underground. So it needs that much of space underground. So space them four inches apart, thin them out essentially. And then um, what else? Um, yeah, if you've got uh, tomatoes and uh, eggplants and cucumbers and um, uh, what else? 
beetroots and broccoli, wherever you've grown these heavy feeders, don't put the same heavy feeders in the same spot. If you're growing all the, uh, if you're going to grow the, the kale and the beetroot, um, the pumpkins, all the uh, pumpkins actually will be almost done, but the cabbage and the broccoli, don't put them where you have just planted your tomatoes and your peppers and your eggplants, because those are all heavy feeders. Uh, sort of switch things around. Plant, plant your lettuce and your carrot and your leafy greens into places where you've had summer vegetables growing. So uh, essentially, because those heavy feeders would have already depleted the soil of all of its energy. And so you will have to double up the energy in that soil uh, so, that some, so that another set of heavy feeders starts eating from it. So then do a light feeder with a heavy feeder, light feeder with a heavy feeder, and keep rotating that as you go along through the year and through the years. Um, and then let's see, you can also, this is a good time, <clears throat> not right now, but let's say in a few weeks from now when it cools down, it's a good time to sow onion bulbs or garlic bulbs and anything that is a bulb, uh, scallions, shallots, all of them, you can start sowing them. And again, sow them apart because imagine the whole bulb, how big the onion is going to become un underneath. So onions and shallots and all, this whole onion family, you can also grow from seed and let, let the seedlings form, but they take a long time to seed. And so of course, if you start now in about you know a few weeks from now, you will have seedlings and you will have something that you can then thin out and spread out. With the onion family, generally I, um, I, I tell people just go and buy the seedlings and don't worry so much about this, the seeds because often people, so I don't know why, but they don't have success growing it from seed. Maybe because it takes a lot of time and because it takes so much time to germinate, if you, have, if you went, go wrong with, the, with watering your, your seed trays, it's all, the whole trick is about how much water you give to your seed trays and it should at all times feel like a moist, squeezed out sponge fluffy, airy, light, and moist. And that gives those seeds a chance to germinate. And then um, what else? I think I'm going to, um, uh, for, for right now, like right now, everybody's vegetables are growing uh, the most. So I would still fertilize them so that you can get a nice long season of getting more corn heads, more tomatoes, more peppers, you know, more eggplants. Uh, and so every two weeks, feed them. And don't feed them with some strong fertilizer. Feed them with something like vermicompost, which is, you know, sort of lighter and softer on the soil. And, and whenever you feed them, feed them, uh, water them thoroughly. So do the feeding in the early morning as well, so that, <clears throat> so that you can also water it thoroughly and the plant has had a time, had its uh, opportunity to drink it all up, drink up the water, drink up the nutrients and then all day long, you know, provide itself with this nourishment. Um, um, well, I, I think I'm going to allow you guys to ask me questions. There aren't, let me see how many people are here in this room. Not a, not a whole lot. I think we can all sort of take turns and ask questions because it's difficult for me to juggle the answers in I don't type fast enough. So by the time I type my answers, it'll, it'll take a while. So you can unmute yourselves. And if you have any question to ask, please start asking so that, you know, so that we can just address everything there's, there is to address, at least as much as I can address. Any questions? No questions? I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a minute. I, I have a quick question. Oh, yes. you can nope, you go, for it. go ahead. Okay. Fatima, uh, what your name oh. Is? oh, my name is Fatima. Yes. Fatima. <laughs> okay. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Fatima. Um, so I joined the call a couple minutes late. Um, I was wondering if we might get access to the recorded yes. Zoom call by any chance. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. On the Regenerative Collective page, you'll have. I think it's a YouTube channel and then it'll be on there. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, hello, thanks for doing this. Um, I'm wondering if all seeds should be sprouted before we put them in soil 
or if just putting them in, in the soil and then watering and giving some light is good enough? Um, some of the, you can direct sow any seed. <clears throat> you don't need to necessarily sprout a seed to plant it. But some of the thicker, heavier seeds like, um, like pumpkin and squash and garbanzo beans and fava beans and anything that is a bean. And uh, if you sprout it, it just makes the process go much faster and less chances of the bugs eating up the seed underground uh, while the seed is germinating. So it, it, again, if your moisture levels aren't exact in the soil, if it's too soggy and wet, somebody else is gonna get to that seed before that seed has a chance to germinate. So, so when your seeds are nice and big, yeah, germinate them. Particularly all the beans and the peas and uh, um, the bees, the peas, the squash, uh, germinate them and let them let this, the coat kind of break and uh, the first little, first little stem come out uh, and first little leaf come out and then, uh, then plant them in the soil. But all the other smaller seeds, just plant them directly. Great, thanks. Yep, you're welcome. I have other questions if no one else does. If, yeah, go for it. Cool, so um, I, we're, one of the things I like about Regenerative Collective is that they're uh, taking over um, maybe like public spaces or spaces near roads that have been neglected. And so um, a lot, um, some of the areas where we're growing, I'm up in Western Washington state, are subject to pollution. It might be in someone's backyard that's near an, you know, an automotive shop or for whatever reason, the soil can't really be trusted. And so I'm wondering, um, is it possible to, you know, if we're harvest, if we're growing like uh, comfrey or uh, yarrow in what we assume to be polluted soil, then can we take the seeds and then plant it in healthy soil? And then will that get rid of the pollution or do you know how many generations it takes to? Oh, the short answer to your question, no, I don't know how many generations it takes <laughs> because I'm not a, not, um, a soil expert. Mm. But uh, what I do myself, because um, I'm a school garden teacher and much of our, sc our school land is also polluted. And mm. so um, if I'm growing directly in soil and not on a raised bed, but directly in soil. The first season, I plant plants that are good, um, uh, that uptake toxins. And then I cut them and then unfortunately I throw them away. Um, I don't eat them. I don't have the children eat them. We don't eat them, but we trash them. And some people don't trash them. Some people just leave them as uh, compost, as like mulch and uh, to get back into mm. the soil. But I'm not a soil scientist, so I don't know how much of that toxin is in the entire plant. I know that it gets, um, it gets diluted or diffused or the, or the chemical composition of those poisonous toxins do change. The plants change all of that. But I don't have a clear answer for that. Therefore, I just throw that first crop away. And then I start, and then the next season, I start planting food that I, plants that I'm going to eat. And so, you know, I would grow sunflowers and I would grow uh, corn, actually. And um, yes, yarrow and a bunch of native plants. Native plants to your area here in Southern California, native plants are incredible in uptaking poisonous material from soil, particularly lead and all the other poisons that are in our soil from the freeways and from the atmosphere and from everywhere else. Um, so the first season, you know, start planting a bunch of native plants and clean up that soil. You're not gonna eat that stuff. Uh, yes, most of the native plants, actually you can drink teas of it, but don't grow it with that purpose. Grow it with the purpose of cleaning up your soil. And furthermore, do plant cover crops that like sunflowers, like fava beans, um, and then let them take up the poisons and throw them away and then start growing food the next season. You gotta just have to be, you know, patient and not be in a hurry to suddenly start growing everything really healthy, fantastic food for yourself. Just go slowly uh, and you will 
because the main thing is to have healthy soil. That's really the key to all gardening. Your soil is good, everything is good. But your soil doesn't live in a vacuum. The soil lives with air, the soil lives with water. And so these are all symbiotic relationships, not to mention everything that lives inside soil, the bacteria, the fungus, and all the other creatures that live in soil. So focus on building good soil health. Uh, one of the things that I uh, recommend to do is, is this is a good time to plant cover crops. Like after you've harvested all your summer vegetables, um, then let your, uh, let your bed sit a little bit for a, for a few weeks, like a month. But in October, plant a bunch of, bunch of cover crops, uh, like fava beans and like winter rye or like alpha alpha. These are, these are all high nitrogen producing plants that fix nitrogen, nitrogen that's in the atmosphere, nitrogen that's in the soil. They change the composition of that nitrogen so that it's, it becomes plant available nitrogen. And so uh, these cover crops, you know, people don't, well, I eat fava beans in my tradition, but most people don't, they just consider it to be a cover crop. And so they grow it as a green manure or a cover crop, and then they chop it and drop it back into that same bed, which is what we all should be doing. But before you chop it and drop it in that bed, eat the seeds, they're absolutely delicious. And they're, you know, they're absolutely edible. The flowers are edible, the leaves are edible, and certainly the, the beans are edible and extremely nutritious. So eat everything and then chop the stems and drop them. And the other thing with the cover crops is uh, don't pull the roots out. I don't anyways, some people do, I generally don't because the roots um, create these sort of tunnels in the soil, right? Air pockets in the soil. And that, that keeps this air circulation going and not to mention the nutrients going up and down and every which way. So allowing the worms to move, allowing air to move, allowing everything to move and not choke down there. So I leave the roots and I kind of cut back my cover crops all the way to the end so that flush with the soil and, and then chop it smaller and let it sit on, on that same bed and then cover it with more soil, more compost, more soil. Kind of layer it like a lasagna. Um, so yeah, to get rid of pollution, that first generation of plants, definitely don't eat them trash them. But uh, a soil person is Lin Fang. I'll, I'll write the name down here in chat. Yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. Lin Fang. Um, if you Google her, you'll find her. You'll find her on Instagram. You'll find her Facebook page that's called uh, Soil Ecology. And you get a lot of answers to your soil related questions, including how to clean soil up. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So, um, I have a question. Yes, Nemi. Hi, Nemi? yes. Hi, my name is Nemi. Thank you. Thank Nemi. you for, for doing this. So, my question is. And I do a lot of composting, and so my question is, a lot of our squash and our cucumber, it's yeah. drying out. So would it be a good idea to reuse the dead leaves to put in my compost? Um, so it depends. It depends if your leaves don't have any disease on them, then sure, because they're meant to dry out. At this point in the year, they start drying out and they kind of become all shriveled up. But your squash is looking really healthy and delicious because all the energy is going to that fruit. The, 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 host, the mother plant is trying to make babies basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, or has made babies are trying to really make this baby really healthy so that the seeds are healthy so that you can make more squash. So uh, to answer your question, if your leaves are not diseased in any way throughout the summer, then sure, chop it and put it into your compost pile. But if you have disease, particularly, not particularly any disease, if you've had aphids, if you've had spider mites, if you've had, in the squash family, there's usually powdery mildew. Powdery mildew will look like, you know, powder, white powder initially on the green leaves, but then later the, green, the leaf kind of shrivels up and completely dries out and you can't see the mildew anymore. But if you had seen any of this on your green leaves before, before they dried out, then I would say no, definitely no, because you're carrying the disease, the pathogens, into your compost unless 
you are a professional you know commercial composter where you are heating the compost up to a level where it's going to kill all the wheat seeds and kill all the pathogens and all the nasty stuff but you know you're doing composting at home so throw it away thank you you're welcome anyone else what what is everyone growing i would i'd curious to know i mean besides uh, well just tell me any anyone jump in you can jump in and and by the way you can all just mute yourself unless there's something going on in the background and you don't want to you don't need to stay muted so i've actually um been trying i i love passion fruit and i bought a plant about over a year ago mm -hmm. and she just doesn't want to have any fruit um mm. and i planted a new one um on a different direction mm -hmm. and it seems that they grow really fast but um i guess something is missing in the soil that they're yeah. um at least for the one that i've had for over a year um still no fruit but then again i'm still learning about the plant so i don't know if it takes a few years to settle in and finally give fruit I I don't know whether how how many years passion fruit takes to actually give fruit but usually it's calcium or potassium or both that are not being taken up by the plant and therefore you have less fruit those are the two minerals that produce uh, produce fruit so that might be the missing link in your soil but I'm not sure whether it takes a year or it takes two or three years before your vine sets fruit usually I, I think passion fruit you know after a year it should start giving flowers and fruit and also once it flowers you need pollinators this is something that most people don't um, think of including myself I, i have to remind myself that i should be planting flowers in my garden in my vegetable garden and, mm -hmm. and two kinds of flower i mean native plants that bring the right kind of pollinators the pollinators that belong here to our area and to our region um, and and flowers that simply uh, attract pollinators because without that pollination you you're not going to get enough fruit growing so remember to intersperse your vegetables with flowers always and many of these flowers like calendula or or marigold um these are edible you know you can eat them you can also dye clothes with them or anything you can dye fabric or beads or or whatever you would like to dye with them paper <clears throat> but you can but they also they also pest control plants and they bring pollinators so uh, and then the and then the native plants really bring a ton of bees and birds and those guys are very very critical for your fruit production food production so plant a bunch of salvias native salvias the yarrow is great um the fuchsias uh the native sunflowers the native asters there's just a lot of native plants so pick what you like but pick the ones that particularly like bees and and birds and then plant them so that so that you got your fruit really your food and vegetables growing healthy um i think i'll i'll go on to talk about unless you want me to talk continue talking about what we should or shouldn't be um planting the, the other thing is if you already do have flowers growing in your garden at this time of the year just deadhead all the you know everything including things like perennials that that bloom year after year after year uh deadhead them so that and really cut them back pretty low so that they come back again and in these cooler as the days become cooler and the soil becomes cooler you'll get a nice good fall bloom from the same perennials Other, otherwise you you know what's the point of having perennial if they're just going to bloom now and they're going to go to seed and become all gangly and huge and then you want to throw the whole bunch out right and so don't do that um also what else what else what else what else i have a question yes Thank you again. Um I so I this is my first season um with the with the small vegetable garden and um my summer squash is still producing and 
um, flowering a lot. Um, I, I guess I just don't know when I should, when it's like, when it's time to pull it and say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Say goodbye. Um, um yeah. It's time to say goodbye, uh, depending on your squash. First of all, if your squash is looking like too big for its boots, then it's not going to taste all that great. So, so cut it while, it, while it's big enough where you're going to eat it. You know, it's not gone. It's not just full of seeds inside, but it's also got some flesh inside. That's one thing. Leave one plant for seed. That's for sure. Uh, but everything else, if the vine has dried up completely, the leaves are dry, the vine is dry, then it's, they've done their time. Then you can cut it back and harvest all your, uh, all your vegetable and yeah, bring it in and start saving it for the winter. As far as pumpkins go, sorry, the same family, they'll keep growing. Even on these dry vines, they'll be sitting over there looking kind of, sorry, miserable, but they'll keep growing. They'll grow bigger and bigger and bigger. But make sure that they're not moist, that, that there isn't any moisture underneath. So there's, there's mulch underneath. Is that Joe asking me that question? Yeah, we, we met, you came to my backyard and yes, I gave you yes, the hi. So, so hi. So keep the, um, keep it kind of put some mulch, you know, like hay or something, and then put the pumpkin on top of it. So that, so add, that uh, that's yeah, what I, I just harvested a couple. Yes. Um, but that's kind of what it looks like. It's still pretty green, but I, I feel like it's t probably time. There's nothing else. Or is it? I, I don't know what I'm looking for, I guess. It, it, it's good. You should eat it. Okay. When it gets too big, it doesn't taste half as good as when it's a little smaller. And on these squash leaves, when you see all of this white powdery mildew and stuff, just cut those leaves off and throw them away in your trash can. Don't let them okay. just sit there. Because they're airborne diseases okay. and they carry it to the next guy and the next guy and you don't want that to happen okay thank you yeah you're welcome so as uh, you guys i'm going to ask you to give me a, a minute because i need to turn something off on the stove i'll be right back i wish i had some music to play or something to put onto my screen let's see no not this that I don't know what to put here. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna share my screen and then go turn the stove off and I'll be right back. So it has nothing to do with anything. It's just a bunch of mountain pictures. It has nothing to do with vegetables, but I'll be right back. I'm back. I guess my screen didn't get shared. I don't know what happened. Um, we can see it, or at least I can. I'm sorry? I can see the pictures. You can? Yeah, me too. Okay, yeah. that's great. Succulents, blue mm -hmm. sky. The mountains. Um, so going back to... Going back to... Um, what do we do with all of this, all this vegetable that we have and fruit that we have? Uh, also, before, before we go to the fruit and the vegetables, this is a good time to start planning for fruit trees. If you are into, um, let, me, let me get rid of the, this sharing business because it's very distracting to me, but except I don't know how to do that now. Mm, oh, well. When Joe and Teresa come back, they'll figure it out. But um, it's a good time to, to think about your fruit trees. 
if you want to plant new ones, add one or two or however much space you have, then uh, this is a good time to start prepping your soil, start putting mulch on the soil, start improving the health of your soil so that in about a month from now, you're ready to start planting trees. And also uh, towards the end of the year, towards um, I would say November or so, actually November might be too soon, but um, December, before the real rains begin, I would start, uh, if you already have fruit trees, uh, particularly stone fruit like plums and apricots and peaches and um, pears, apples, uh, cut them back for, for size. You prune them for size. Pruning can be a whole other, pruning of course is not something that you just, just take a pruning shear and go whack, whack, whack. There is a whole technique to it. And, uh, and it's really important to follow that technique. Otherwise the tree gets damaged pretty badly for a long time. But for now, just for the health of your trees, if you already have them, then uh, be sure, if you haven't done this already, be sure that you have a nice wide basin around it. Um, in other words, about three feet away from the trunk of the tree, push the mulch away, push, push everything away and make a kind of a basin and, and create a low berm, kind of like a low uh, wall, like a low little mountain around this, around this ring, around the tree. And then in that basin is where you will water the tree deeply. Even now in the winter, in the summer, in this extreme heat, uh, water those trees down deeply so that the roots go, go down to look for water, deep down. And not on the surface because it all just dries up and mulch it nice and good. But remember when you mulch your fruit trees, don't mulch it all the way up to the trunk of the tree keep it away about six or seven inches away from the trunk of the tree. Because when the mulch is uh, layered so close to the, uh, lies so close to the trunk of the tree, then moisture kind of stays right there. And then that moisture kind of creeps up through the, through the cambium layer of the, of the trunk. And then disease goes up and disease comes down. And five years later, your tree is suddenly dead and you wonder what the heck, you know, it was just fine. So always keep the mulch away from the trunk of the tree and feed it and also with your vegetables if you want to take this the season if you want to make it longer then remember to feed it uh, and water it down i think i already mentioned this before but um with your with your um, if you want a nice uh, spring show of bulbs flowering bulbs like um, narcissus and hyacinth and tulips and so on if you're just doing ornamental stuff then this is a good time to plant those uh, bulbs as well by this i don't mean august <laughs> i mean when the weather cools down and your temperatures of your soil have come down pretty dramatically down in the 70s um but since we're only talking about vegetables i would say you know uh, just keep deadheading your flowers if you have any in the garden to prolong uh, prolong its life and you keep getting more flowers. So, um, so then talking about what to do with too much produce besides sharing it and eating it. Um, <clears throat> with tomatoes, a lot of people like to freeze them. So what they do is they, you sort of cut it up into quarters and you lay them on a sheet, like a baking sheet, and stick the whole thing in the freezer. Like, you know, not, not all bunched up together, but a little separate, and, and freeze them. And then take them out of the freezer and then put them into a Ziploc bag and freeze the whole lot. Some people go through, do it that way. Uh, I myself, I just freeze the whole tomato. I just put a whole bunch of, I don't cut them, I just freeze them whole. And then when you take them out of the freezer, then the peel just comes off really easily. And then you can cook the tomato whichever way you want, whenever, way you, whenever you want it. The other fun way of doing, of, um, uh, of uh, saving tomatoes for the winter and, and for another season <clears throat> is to dry them. And the sun is so hot right now, it's, it's a wonderful time to dry anything and everything. So I slice the tomatoes uh, or not slice, I, so again, I make them into quarters, into wedges, 
<clears throat> lay them in a, on a sheet um, and then put them outside and cover them with some kind of muslin, some kind of thin breathable fabric so that the dust and the bugs and whatnots don't come in, into it, but, but, uh, but it sort of, it dries clean and keep them in the sun for you know a week or however long it takes for it to dry up nicely and then stick them in a jar and store them. You can also just put olive oil in the jar or fill your jar with, with the vegetable that you dried or the fruit that you dried and then pour olive oil on top of it all the way to the top. You can be creative with it. You can add a few cloves of garlic into that bottle. You can add some chili peppers into that bottle or you can just leave it clean and smooth and just, just the tomatoes and the olive oil. You can also add any kind of herb you like to give it that flavor. Yeah, just be creative with it. Do whatever you feel like with it. But you can also just dry it, dry it and then just store it in a jar. But <clears throat> by putting the olive oil, you preserve it a little better. Less chances of it getting all moldy and funny. Um, by drying it and then putting it in a jar, if you haven't dried it 100%, there is possible, if there is some moisture in it, there is a possibility of it becoming moldy and, and going bad. Um, <clears throat> Same thing with, you know, if you have a fig tree and you have tons of figs growing, they're really delicious dry. I would say just, you know, harvest up most of them and don't even bother cutting them in half. Just let them sit out in the sun and dry them and, and save them. With citrus, um, with citrus, I generally slice them into rings and then uh, lay them out to dry. Or I peel them. Yes, that's correct, Steve. Lin Fang's Instagram is L underscore Fang. Um, she's a soil scientist and she can tell you anything and everything about soil. Um, so with the citrus, I generally use a potato peeler and I peel off the first layer and then I make slivers of it and then I dry those slivers and I use that, uh, the, the citrus peel in all kinds of cooking. And then the rest of it, I juice it and then fill a ice cube tray full of it and then store it as you know ice cubes of lemon juice or orange juice or any kind of citrus juice um, but also just simply slice the citrus in nice neat slices thin slices and sun dry them and use those you know, cooking afterwards um, what else uh, the beans and the all, all the peas and the beans uh, if if you haven't eaten them fast enough i let them go to seed and then simply save the seeds and then obviously then you can cook the seeds. And the herbs, again, the herbs, uh, cut them back and then make a nice bundle, tie them up and hang them upside down in a dark place, preferably, so that the color doesn't discolor. Otherwise the color becomes like black and brown and it doesn't look so exciting. But if you dry, dry them in, in the dark part of your garage place, then they'll, the color remains. And so dry as many herbs as you can, because those, of course, you can you know, use for the longest time. And then store all of these things in jars. Um, I also pickle a lot of vegetable and fruit. Uh, and by pickle, I don't just mean cucumbers as pickle. Uh, somebody had a question. Give me, Fatima, just give me one second. Uh, what you can do is um, cook them. In other words, cook them in, Let's say that you have, let's say that you have uh, eggplant or cucumber or uh, squash or lots of apricot or plums. You can cook these things in with, with a bit of sugar and a bit of acidity. So whether you're using any kind of, any kind of vinegar that you could use and any kind of sugar that you like, I usually use brown sugars um, and, and then put a few put some kind of herbs in it, put some kind of quite a bit of salt in it, and then give it a one boil and then cool it down and store it in jars. And, and all of those make really tasty sort of pickles, but like something that you can eat on the side with your meals, with any, any kind of meal that you're eating. Uh, Fatima, you had your hand up. You wanted to ask a question, go, go for it. Oh, hi, yeah. Um, I. I'm making some compost here at home and I realized that uh, there are some worms moving through it. It's not uh, 
you know, like the long worms that we usually look for in gardens. They're more like larva, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's okay for me to add it to my soil right now, or if I should wait for them to die off and then add it, or okay. um, not really sure what to do with them or what to I, think of them. It, well, uh, just just leave them there and uh, let them be in your compost, but use the compost. Dunk them back in the compost, in other words. Those, they, are, they are great at eating up and shedding up whatever's in there, but they also yeah. shred up your root systems in your beds. So I, I'm assuming they look white and they're kind of like a, like a little shrimp or curled up thing. And yeah, exactly like that. Yeah, they are, they are grubs. They'll become beetles. They're probably June beetles, some kind of beetle anyways. And they are not- yeah, they're very small they're, though. They're, they're small, not the, the bigger kind. They grow pretty big. And you can, if somebody has chickens, pull them all out and give it to that person and sort of feed it to their chickens. They love it. But they're also good in your compost pile because they are good shredders. They, they're going to decompose matter and you want them there, but you don't want them in your beds. Okay, so once uh, my compost is ready and they die out, Sift them then out. I can they add it to my I, soil. I, just sift them out. Just sort of pull them out with your hand and dunk them back in your compost. Okay. Don't worry oh, about all right. them. Just don't put them in your bed. Don't put them wherever you're planting your vegetables. Don't, don't let them go there. Okay. But in your compost pile, they're fine. They can live there till they die there or till they become a beetle and fly off somewhere. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, um, so does anybody have excess of anything? Like fruit or vegetables that you don't know what to do with? Yeah, uh, we have, I'm, I'm working with a, a farm that's trying to become incorporated as a permaculture like education center. I'm mm -hmm. up in Western Washington state mm -hmm. and they have um, a whole bunch of fig trees. Mm -hmm. which we have more than we can do with. Mm -hmm suggestions for how to save some of that you can dry them they make really good dry fruit hmm. um, nice. i have a small I, dehydrator yes they make excellent dry fruit so i would say before they all become mush and you know fall off your trees because they do become that uh, at the end of the season or the beetles get them then dry them and also uh, pickle them. You can cook them up with some other fruit or vegetable. Uh, something else that will counterbalance the sweetness of the of the fig, and create some kind of pickles and pickle them and and then put them in jars and eat them as a like a condiment on the side. As I was mentioning about you know you can do that with plums, you can do that with figs, you can do that with with apricots, apples. You can do it pretty much with everything, with the tomatoes, with the eggplants. I'm not saying that you mix them all up together, but I'm saying you can make, um, I, I, I don't have links to share with you, but most of the Mediterranean cultures, most of the Middle Eastern culture, I, I should say most, all Middle Eastern cultures, Mediterranean cultures, uh, make a lot of these side dish and, and Asian cultures, my Asian culture, and by Asia, I mean Southeast Asia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. A lot of something we call chutneys. A lot of chutneys are made with fruit and vegetables. And that's another way of preserving excess fruit and vegetable. And I'm sure if you Google all the chutneys, you'll find lots of chutney recipes, even for figs. Hmm. Yeah. I, I shouldn't say lots, but you will find them. You will find them. So you could do that, but drying is really the, the best way to just preserve it all. Nice. And they last longer. Be sure that you dry the heck out of them though. <laughs> There's no moisture, no fungus happens afterwards. I'm also uh, interested in uh, fermentation. Did I miss some of that? Uh, you know, when you make the, no, you didn't miss, we didn't talk about fermentation, but when you're making these pickles that I'm talking about, that is pretty much what you're doing it because you're cooking it with vinegar. And so you are fermenting the fruit or the vegetable and therefore it lasts longer. Or then for instance, with all the citrus, 
all I do is uh, pack them in a jar. Um, before I pack them in a jar, uh, I'll cut them into fours without cutting them all the way to the end. Just the bottom is kind of still connected. And then I stuff that, that fruit with salt and red chili powder and some turmeric and kind of really stuff it, all, all of it. And then, and, and then put one lemon into another, into another, just stuff the whole jar and squeeze one lemon juice on top of it and then let it sit in the sun. Or you can do this even with just with salt, but quite a bit of salt because the salt will uh, preserve it and also ferment and the sun will ferment it and just let it sit out in the hot sun and slowly the color of your lemon will change and it'll become like a light brown. And um, maybe a few months later, you can open it and see it'll, it'll have softened up and then you can eat it and it's delicious. It's already now fermented and it's, uh, and it's preserved. Um, the excess salt will preserve it and it won't go bad. Usually if I open the jar like that, then I put it back in the fridge because just in case, because there is no preservative in it. And, and, the, and the turmeric, it just makes it nice and sort of bright yellow because otherwise the, the citrus tends to become a shade of brown. Um, and again, shade of brown is just fine because you could let that lemon sit for maybe two years and two years later, the, the whole thing will be a dark brown and very soft and very fermented and extremely delicious. My, my mouth is watering as I'm even describing it to you. So the longer you keep it, the longer it ferments and the, and the tastier it gets. Um, I do that with garlic. Um, just stuff it in a jar, uh, put some vinegar, a little bit of sugar, salt, of course, and then just let it sit there for, for a year. And then it's, it's, it's soft and delicious for you to eat. I do that with the eggplants. I do that with a lot of things. If any of you uh, want specific recipes, I'll, uh, you can email me. Let me type my email address here. I can then share some of these recipes with you. These are all my own concoctions. So I don't really have something written out, but then I can, I can make a list and tell you what to do. And you may like those tastes. Um, and of course, you know, people make um, pestos with all those herbs, all those carrot tops that you, or carrot leaves that you can't eat or don't eat. I mean, you can eat, but let's say you didn't eat. Then um, that or it, pesto doesn't have to be basil, you know, always. It can be any, any green. It can even be kale or chard or, or spinach or whatever green stuff there is that is edible. You can just uh, grind it up and make it into a pesto and save that. And uh, with pesto, I, again, I make little cubes of it, make a whole bunch of pesto and then put it into a ice tray and then save it as cubes so that I just take out a cube whenever I need it as opposed to, you know, big chunks of it. Um, and, um, yeah, the, and of course, you can also just simply take all your excess vegetable and make stock with it. And the same thing, make, you know, with, of course, with stock, you can use the root, you can use the stem, you can use every part of the plant, as long as it's not diseased. And boil it all up and make a nice, good, thick, like a rich stock. Don't, don't dilute it so much with water. And, and then, or let's say you put a pot full of water with vegetables, simmer that down to half a bottle of the liquid. And then uh, again in ice cubes, freeze it, and then you've got all of this uh, ready stock that is also frozen. Obviously everybody needs big gigantic freezers, but that's one way of, uh, you know, preserving stuff. Yes, Joe. You had a question, Joe? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was mute. Um, yeah, so the other question I had was, um, I, I, I want to attempt at trying to plant three, the three sisters, um, but I only have raised beds on concrete, and I haven't really seen a lot of online resources of like how to do that with raised beds. Um, is there any advice that you might have for that? Yeah, so 
your give me just one second i still have to check something on on the stove um let me just mute myself for a for a minute oh well oh hang on i'm sorry this is this is a one one woman show hang on I'm so sorry about all these breaks. Um, the, uh, where were we? So Joe, you were asking, you have raised beds on asphalt. So you can grow the three sisters, but the three sisters have already grown, right? Is that what you're saying? Or you want to grow them again? Uh, I would I would like to attempt to, to grow them um, for the, like, yeah. Next year. Um, yeah, next year. And I'm just, a lot of the resources that I see online kind of, you know, it's with a field or with like yeah. a large area and, and not so much of how to deal with that with large um, planter boxes. Um, and I, yeah. I was just wondering what might be like a smart way to do that in terms of just like spacing and yeah. how to construct that for them to all support each other. Um, so even though you have a box, you can still grow the three sisters in, in them. All, all you, the, the make mounds, like make a long mound for the corn. Corn likes to be on mounds. And so corn should be right on top. And then the next, next thing on that mound are your beans so that the beans kind of wrap themselves around the corn as they grow. And then the last thing at the bottom of this little hill that you've created in your bed would be your squash that will cover up all the soil and keep the soil uh, shaded and moist through the hot summer, like right now. And so uh, it's not impossible, it's not ideal because your space is limited, but so what, you know? Um, just, make, just make sure that you, you, you create a mound. You can also make circular mounds within your bed, like a, like a round, you know, like a round little hill. And the corn should be right on top of that hill, a whole bunch of them, three or four of them, because then the corn will lean on each other. And, and if they get too unwieldy, you can sort of tie them all up together because they do tend to get unwieldy as they go taller and taller and taller. And then of course the beans will wrap themselves around it. And, and, the, and in your bed, your entire bed will pretty much be covered by all the squash family or whatever squash you've grown. So you can do it. There's nobody's, you don't have to have a ton of land to do any of these things. If you have one container in which you can make, you know, this little mound and yeah. do these three things, go for that. In fact, some people actually even put, uh, start seeding corn and grow another session of corn right now. The squash is a bit late to do, but you could try the corn right now. Just okay. Put some more corn seeds right now and see how far because uh, you you might just get some corn. I don't know how much corn you'll really get because it will get cold. It, right now it feels like oh my goodness, when is the heat going to end? But it will. And, and and push comes to shove. And if your corn hasn't given you fruit before it's before winter, then uh, then it's a great plant to that cleans up soil first of all, and is going to provide tons of uh, uh, carbohydrate to your soil so then just chop it and drop it and put it back in the soil as a as manure thank you every, every, you're welcome and everything that you're chopping if it's not diseased then just drop it back into your beds guys don't trash anything just chop it small so that it ultimately becomes uh, becomes soil it's food for your soil and it's all these plants have taken all of the sunlight all summer long turning that into sugar, into good carbohydrate, and into nitric and you know rich nitrogen, then it makes no sense to throw it away and just go and buy a bag of soil. And uh, Teresa and Joe, I guess you guys are back. Oh, are you guys back? I'm not sure. Yeah, we're back. Okay. 
I think we've, uh, I think we've pretty much covered whatever it is that we had to cover. At least I think so. But if anybody needs to ask anything, go for it. I'm here. Um, I, we could share that flyer too for the food preservation. Yes. Oh yes. Um, okay. So let me see. I, I did not do it. Um, if you can, I don't know where it is, Teresa, but if you could, uh, Oh yeah, I just emailed it to myself. Mm -hmm. So we'll open it up right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So th there is a farm in Pomona called, uh, my Spanish isn't any good, but Puerta de Valle, I think that's how it's pronounced. And they are having a, a, a preservation uh, workshop very soon, I think this weekend. And I, I, if anybody, any of you live there, it's a great farm and, and they have a farm stand and they have some wonderful vegetables and fruit and you could go shop, but also you could learn about how to preserve food from them. Here um, I have a question. What, what, are the, what are the different kinds of food preservations? Um, well, drying, pickling, um, and um, mostly drying and pickling and preserving in, and brining, preserving in, uh, in salt, and then of course freezing. That's, those are the ones that I know, Teresa. What are, what are your, the favorite, favorite, the ones that you like to I do? like most, I cook things up and make pickles out of just about everything. <laughs> I like that method the most because I like sort of um, sour and uh, uh, sour and sweet combinations of, of food. And so when I'm pickling things, there's always a ton of salt and something sour, either it's vinegar or it's lemon. Um, and then there is always sugar. There's some kind of brown sugar or molasses. I use molasses. Molasses is, an, is another, I don't know how to make molasses, but certainly molasses is a, another way of preserving fruit. It's, it doesn't look like fruit anymore, but it's like this nice, thick, rich juice of that fruit that uh, really flavors food really well. So people make uh, grape molasses, you know, date molasses, um, pomegranate molasses. Pomegranate is round the corner. I even dry the pomegranate seeds. They are excellent. Uh, we use them a lot in our food in Pakistan and um, in Southeast Asia. And so, yeah, you can dry the pomegranate seeds. And um, yeah, so my favorite things, I'm pickling everything up. And I don't have a big fridge, so I don't freeze too many things. I don't have much room, which is why I juice things or, I, or make pestos out of all the various herbs or all the various greens in any case. And then I store them in ice, little ice cube formations because I don't have room. I don't have a deep freezer, but whoever does, you know, freezing is really a terrific shortcut for cooking. And if you can, then why not? And, and basically use, you know, just like in gardening, I would say there is no one method that works all the time for everything. There is no one sure shot saying that let's dry all the fruit. Some fruits dry better, some fruits just don't. Like grapes, if there's too much of it, or the birds are getting to all of it, then I just pluck them all raw and then I just dry them up. Some will dry easily, some won't dry easily. Um, plums, I've been drying plums for the last one month. They're just sitting out there and not drying in spite of this crazy heat outside. There's so much sugar and juice in it. They, they are so juicy that they're just not drying fast enough. So, uh, yeah, so one method doesn't work for it, you know, for everything. So do a little bit of each one of those methods and see what really works best for you and what's really most convenient to your lifestyle. You're a teacher, Teresa. I'm sure you don't have much time to do too many things. So, you know, whatever speaks to you that uh, this is the easiest way to store all of this food. Yeah, I really want to try pickling. Um, Steve mentioned in the chat that the registration for the flyer, the event we just posted is 
closed. Oh, which means they've probably already got enough people. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a pity. But would you would you mind opening up the convert um oh, the discussion? Okay. Anyone has questions about yeah. food preservation? Let's see. I unmute. I, I've been asking everybody to ask me, so they've been unmuting themselves, but I guess there is some way that I can unmute everyone at the same time. And how is that? Oh, I, I think it would be better um, if they un unmuted themselves when they talk. Otherwise, there's a lot of background, like feedback. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I, everybody has been actually doing that, asking, uh, asking me various question as, uh, questions as, as we've been going along. And um, as far as I know, we've pretty much covered a lot of stuff. Uh, if there is anything else you want to know, just keep asking, and I'll try and keep. So asking. you, so you don't use a food dehydrator. You just um, no, uh, dry it out in the sun. Yeah, only because I don't have one, <laughs> so I don't use it. But um, I, I use very old-fashioned methods of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and and I use a reed mat because it's breathable and it's this natural material and then I and I lay my food on top of it and then I cover it with muslin like thin cotton fabric breathable fabric so that the bugs and the flies and the dust doesn't go into it and then I just let it sit out in the sun and dry it out and I'm in no rush, uh, so yeah, and they ultimately do dry out. Um, yeah, but if you have a dehydrator, yeah, of course, much, much faster, you can get a lot done, like big batches done a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. My grandma and my parents, um, they dry food out in the sun as well. Yeah, well my that's... grandma did, she was alive. Yeah, I get I'm as old as your grandma too, or at least your mother. So I also do the same thing. By the way, I was I was telling you guys about uh, about feeding your your vegetables, even now, like every few weeks, so that you get a longer harvest, uh, and with your fruit trees. But in a month from now, stop feeding your fruit trees because your fruit trees are not going to do anything more, and all you'll get is a whole bunch of green leaves, and you don't want them. You want it to kind of go slow. So feed it maybe once more in September, if you have fruit trees, and then stop feeding them. And then late, you know, end of December, sometime in December, you can start pruning them to keep them smaller. Because otherwise, when they're too big, it's difficult to harvest. It's difficult to, because they're always going to look for sun. And also, they get really dense, and you want to thin it out so that sunlight comes through and so that you get a lot of fruit. And for usually at the end of summer uh, or just before winter, you prune for, for size. And then after the, after the winter, like early, early spring, you prune for, uh, for fruit. But that whole thing, the story of pruning fruit trees, that's a whole other story. So I, I was telling everyone that, you know, seed saving should be the first thing right now as, it, as the season comes to an end. And particularly if you've got a vegetable that's looked really healthy all summer long, if this one particular tomato vine has given you the best tomatoes that taste good, they look good, and there's been no disease on it, then that's definitely something that you should save for seeds. And so you, you're trying to sort of be a natural selection kind of a uh, architect by saving the seeds of your best growing uh, vegetables so that obviously so that the next set of vegetables are equally good all the other little stuff the misshapen mishap you know the ones that don't look so good or shriveled up or the size isn't right or the taste isn't that great eat them all up now yeah um yeah so I guess, are we done? I guess we're done.
unless anyone else has anything else to ask me. No, if not. I, I have a quick question. Um, yes. So I've been, I've been growing a, a three sisters garden. Yes. Do you have any suggestions for what to plant afterwards? What to plant afterwards? Yes, well, now would be um, all the green leafy vegetables um, are something you can grow for the next season. And, you know, afterwards doesn't mean immediately. Afterwards means give your soil a little bit of a rest, harvest everything. If it's not diseased, chop it and drop it back in the bed. Give fresh compost to your bed and then add some more soil to your bed. And of course, mulch at the end. I, I'm a um, I already have uh, red wigglers in my beds. Do I still need to add mulch or? Uh, you already have red. How is it that you have red? You mean you just have worms in your bed because you have a lot of uh, organic I, I matter? Put, in I put them there. <laughs> you put them in there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's fine. But I would add. Um, I would still add some, I would add some mulch, some good leafy mulch. And I would still add a little bit more compost and some fresh soil, some new soil, and then it all get mixed up. Mm -hmm. And um, and then and then let it let it sit a little bit. Plus chop up all of your three sisters and drop them into this bed also. Those wrigglers will be happy, they'll start eating stuff. Um, and then um, and then wait a little bit till it cools down some. Like I mentioned at the beginning, start making your seedlings separately so that, um, so that a few weeks from now when your seedlings are, have two, two leaves and about you know, an inch or so tall, then you can start planting them into your, into your three sisters bed. So the three sisters bed have already consumed a lot of energy. So you put in plants that require less energy. But if you're, if you're putting in some more kale or some cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli and all of these guys, then yes, you need to add some more compost. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time of planting, it's always a good idea to add compost to your bed. Because it's that, that first, you know, boost of food that they, that the roots will start to eat and drink and water it thoroughly so that, so that it's not, uh, it doesn't burn your little, little babies. It might be too much for, you know, sometimes it's, you can overfeed your, your plants. And so to prevent that overfeeding, you water your beds thoroughly. So watering, you know, remember to always water deeply. And if you, if you don't have a elaborate sprinkler system, put uh, not sorry, not sprinkler system, a uh, drip irrigation system put in there, because with vegetables, you don't, you really never want to be uh, watering the leaves or the fruit or any, any, anything that's on top, you want the water to hit the root system. So just the root gets watered and, and it goes deep, deep down so that the roots go further and further down looking for water as opposed to on the surface. So um, if you don't have a drip system doing that for you, then every time that you water early in the morning, water deeply and not some shallow sprinkling. And then, yeah, and then plant all of the, you know, all the winter vegetables which is really the, the fun, the easier stuff to do. And you can also do carrots and, and radishes. And like I said, all the greens, this is the time to enjoy them. And, and if you want to have a nice long harvest of your spinach and your, your lettuce, then just keep, once they start growing, just keep pulling out the outer ring and eat it and let new ones keep growing. Keep, don't pull off the whole head. You don't need to do that. Just pull off as many leaves as you will eat that day and then they'll just keep growing and you get a much longer harvest. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Very thoroughly, thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Tahare. We really appreciate all your knowledge that you share with us and we love learning from you. We really appreciate you so much. Mm. I enjoy Thank it. Thank you. I, I, I'm not teaching the kids anymore, so I guess you are my new students <laughs> in a strange Aww. way. Online. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that I, I never went to horticultural school or a, 
uh, I don't have a science-based education and I, I do wish that I did have both of those. Um, but much of what I'm talking about, I've learned from doing and learned from not having fear to do it uh, and learned from mistakes, many, 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 which I continue to make. And of course, I've attended a gazillion workshops, including uh, a pretty extensive permaculture course. Uh, but my, the reason I'm saying this is that, you know, you will only be, become good at this once you do it and once you make mistakes doing it. Once the disease happens and the pests happen and the pathogens land on you and, you know, you just got it all wrong. That's a good thing. Don't be afraid of it going wrong because going wrong is certainly going to lead you to the right. So, well, thank you for listening, guys. Oh, thank you. That's a lot of great wisdom. I'm always going to remember that. If any participant here, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, this will be on our YouTube channel. And Tari also um, shared with us composting in a previous meeting and that's also posted in the YouTube channel. And um, following that, she shared with us vermicomposting, very um, detailed and specific about that. So that's also on our YouTube channel. You can check it out. So much wisdom there and experience. Thank you so much, Tahare. You're welcome. You know, I, I was going to say, as, as you were talking, I'm thinking of public service announcements. And one of them is there's a small collective that myself and a few friends have uh, began just before COVID began. And then it went to sleep for a few months and we plan on restarting it pretty soon in a few weeks. Uh, I don't know if we'll meet again in a few weeks, but I will let you guys know on, on, you know, on our regenerative, regenerative uh, Instagram. It's called the Soil Art Collective. And we talk about soil and art and spirituality. And so some of us do art and some of us do soil and some of us talk spirituality. But actually, I shouldn't say that. We all do soil and art and spirituality. And uh, we plan on having a Zoom kind of a workshop pretty soon. And so then I'll let everyone know and it'll be great if you, if you attend, if you're interested in art and soil and spirituality. So that's something. And, and something else that I have been working on and I mentioned in the last, uh, last time, Teresa, was Green Schoolyards America. That's a huge group of educators, designers, parents, and administrators, and anyone who wants kids to learn and be able to come back to school safely, uh, trying to put together a method of bringing school kids back to school safely by bringing them outdoors. So it's about outdoor education, and um, and it's it's free. If you Google them, you'll find them Green Schoolyards America, and anyone can join in the conversation and listen to the conversations. There are eleven working groups, and each group is working on a different aspect of education, and um, it's a very critical, important, and a necessary conversation that's being had by people from across the country and some people from even outside the country. So do join that conversation if any of you are interested. Uh, it, it's under the COVID tab, COVID-19 tab, and anyone can sign up. And you don't necessarily need to do the work, but you can definitely listen into the conversations. So there's 11 working groups. Anyway, so, and then, and that, that's it. That's my last announcement. Yeah, there you go, Teresa. Thank you for posting that. Thank you. That's, that's Joe there pulling all the oh, websites Joe, and images Joe. up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That's our YouTube channel right there. And we'll be posting this soon. Thank you everyone for joining us, for spending your evening with us. And I hope you learned something and please feel free to keep in touch with us and send us a message whenever you need, whenever you have a question.
or want to participate in any of our activities. Thank you again and take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tare. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Have a nice evening. You thank too. you. Thank you, everyone. Hey. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.